patterns, also known as design patterns. These are software architecture design patterns we're talking about now. So how to build your software, how to design the software in itself inside. We're going to talk about some of the most popular ones and just how to use them when you're this architecting your software. So software architecture is all really based on the idea of encapsulation. This is how we scale up to large programs by hiding information. So you want to hide information from or you know hide complexity from everybody else in your team. So this is a good example. This is the same idea we have in the real world uh, with say you know power, right? So you have a computer monitor, it's a really complicated thing. Uh, who knows what's going on in there, but in a lot of pieces is very complicated. And a power generator, also a complicated machine. But these two plug in, right? So they're just connected by this one interface, which is just 120 volts at 60 hertz alternating current, uh, a very simple API. Right. And that's what you want. You want to create your classes such that, yeah, they might be super complicated inside, but to the outside world, all you need to know is just give me power at this and I'm done. And, you know, it has a lot of benefits. Now you can use the same generator to connect a bunch of other things that implement the same API, basically power. Uh, and the monitor can be used with any other generators or electric power systems. And uh, so that's what we do. We try to break things into pieces, encapsulate them, and then we even make larger pieces uh, using those, right? So recursively, we take some of the pieces, put them together. Now it's a complicated mess, but we encapsulate the whole mess such that it's easy for everybody else to use and it's easy for you to use. Let's start with an example. Let's say uh, you want your project is to make a spreadsheet. So you've never done this before. How do you go about building your architecture for it? So what I recommend is you always you start simple, right? So you're like, okay, well, here's my spreadsheet. You focus on the main thing that it does, which is, you know, this spreadsheet itself, right? Uh, and you're like, okay, how am I going to implement that? Well, clearly I am going to need uh, something like this, right? So I'm going to say, uh, here's my spreadsheet. I'm going to need a two-dimensional array of integers. I'm going to call that data. And uh, I'm going to need a method to put numbers in that two-dimensional array. So awesome. That's a good start, right? So start simple. It's like, okay, you know, you notice that. I notice, well, the spreadsheet is mostly just a two-dimensional array of integers. Uh, so that's the first thing I need. Um, so you write that, you draw it out, uh, and uh, and then you think about it. So notice what we're using UML here. Uh, this is a UML class diagram, which you might remember from 240. Uh, and uh, UML is used, you know, and, uh, as you see there, there's some controversy. People will use UML uh, mostly sort of just for drawing and um, well, for doing this, this kind of thing. What we're doing now, we're just architecting, architecting a system. So Check it out. But you start with this, and then obviously you don't stop there. Immediately you realize, well, <laughs> you know, it's not really just integers. Uh, it's also doubles, you know. So people like fractions uh, and uh, decimal points and also formulas. What about those? We need those, right? Spreadsheet has formulas. So you iterate. Right? You're like, okay, you put that away. Okay, next you take another piece of paper and you draw something like this. You say, okay, well, my spreadsheet really is going to be a two-dimensional array of cells. That's what I'm going to call them, cells. You start, you see, you start naming things. And so I'm going to need to set things. And now I notice, well, I'm going to have to set things not just as a double now. So I decided uh, it's not going to be just integers. I'm going to put doubles in there. Uh, but also a string, which I decided is the formula, right? So the, the formulas that you put in a spreadsheet cell. So I'm going to need two set functions like this. And then well, what is a cell? Well, a cell a cell can either be a formula or a number. Right? So I, I figured that out. And uh, I'm going to need these methods here. I'm going to need to get values from it. And then I'm going to need to set the value of a cell. Either, again, the cell can be either a number or a formula. And OK, so what's a formula? Well, I figured that out too. Uh, a formula is uh, if you have done uh, 
this before, you know that a mathematical expression is it's really just a binary tree, right? So you have an operator and then a left side and a and the right hand side. And uh, the left side and right hand uh, sides are recursively formulas themselves. And that, that's a formula, right? That's a mathematical expression captures uh, pretty much everything. Um, not everything, but uh, so it's a really, really good start. And uh, so I know I'm going to need that formula. And uh, well, so I'm going to need to create that formula using uh, maybe I'm going to have to go from the string that the user inputs, right? You know, a1 plus b2 and turn that into this tree like form um, representation or tree representation. And I'm going to need some way to evaluate that formula. So this is my next stage, and this is how I recommend you go through it, right? So you do this, and then you you look at this, and you you realize the, you know there are problems here, uh, and you you know solve some of them, or maybe you just postpone some of them. So at some point, uh, you you know when you get too uncertain about what you got here, and you don't know if this is going to be implementable or not, or you know, so you're not sure you uh, you stop and you start implementing right the more you do this the more comfortable you are with the domain or the programming language or and the platform the farther you can go with the design on paper right so you can sometimes do a lot on paper but when you're first doing it you can only do a little bit you have to go and implement and make sure that this works and then you go back to the paper and figure out some more stuff uh, so okay uh, we're here. The next step is uh, you might realize, well, uh, our first uh, actual pattern is the model view controller design pattern, very popular. Uh, so this is almost every single program does this, whether it's a web application or a desktop application, mobile. Your program is separated into three general areas, the model, which holds uh, all the data. So in our case, what we've been working on is the model. And by the way, this is really the way you should do it. You should develop your or architect your application is start thinking about the model. I think a lot of students start to think about the view, you know, how it looks like. So you're like, I have to build a spreadsheet. You start thinking about how I'm going to put the buttons, etc. cetera. Uh, you are going to have to think about that, but that's not the core of it. You really should start thinking first about the model or the data that you need to store so that's what we've been doing we've been thinking about the spreadsheet data itself and how we're going to store the formulas and how we're going to store the numbers in it so that's the model all these things here are the model then there's another set of classes or part of it that we're going to call the view so the view what the view does it takes the model and shows it to the user so this is all the code that uh, shows stuff to the user, basically draws stuff on the screen. And then the controller takes input from the user and changes the model. So the controller will take, you know, when the user's clicks or the user's text inputs and use those to update the model, which, you know, depending on the system will maybe trigger a, a view update uh, or not. Or maybe you have to do that by hand, depending on what you're doing. So that's the model view controller. All programs should have uh, separate classes. So you try to like minimize these two. Certainly the model should always be separate. Um, so in, for example, in like an Android app, say this was uh, a spreadsheet for Android and Android, uh, the views are, uh, they call them activities. And you have this onCreate method uh, which actually it starts, it creates the activity. There's the uh, on view, uh, which draws it. Uh, so you, there's grid views, which are used to draw grids. And you probably need one of those. So uh, in Android, uh, you might expand the view to actually include the specifics for an Android application. And uh, also in Android, the controller, uh, you, you have to end up, you end up implementing all the handlers, right? So the various text fields, text fields in the feet in the view. This is where the user enters data. Uh, you can create. They have a on click methods associated with them, so you can you, you have to create this on click method to deal with what, what happens when the user clicks and changes the data on this particular text view and this other one and so forth. So and you know that's also a very general 
very similar for iOS and desktop applications, that the controller is a bunch of event handlers. So on, on click view or on focus or whatever, you implement here a bunch of event handlers for events by the user. So when user clicks or types or something, you get a callback and that this is the controller and the view is what you draw. Um, so going back in history, all this stuff with design patterns was started by this book right here, uh, which is, you know, rather old now, but it's still, you know, many of the design patterns in that book are the ones I'm going to present to you, which are used every day and now are just sort of part of it, that something everybody should know. Uh, so check it out, click through here, and there's a list of all the design patterns in that website, and it is still maintained. Uh, okay, so going back to our spreadsheet, let's uh, let's try to deal with the next problem. Uh, so one possible next problem you might think about is, uh, well, let's say, you know, user types in A1 in the cell. Uh, so then that's going to be a reference to cell A1 in the spreadsheet, right? But if the user types equals 4 plus B1, hopefully you know how a spreadsheet works, then that means I'm going to add the number 4 to a reference to whatever it is on cell B1. So that's an expression, right? So I have two types of formula, right? I have references and expressions. Um, or, you know, I could say I have expression and a cell or whatever, but we'll stick with this. Uh, so in my code, you know, you say, okay, that's awesome. So in my code, I'm gonna probably have F is a new formula. And then I'm going to pass it this string, right? So we, we talked about this before, how the constructor takes a string and then it's going to parse that string to create an instance of formula. So, yeah, our class inheritance diagram might look like this. We have a formula and we have two classes that inherit from it. So a formula can either be an expression or a reference. An expression is, you know, the as an operation, left hand side, right hand side. A reference is simpler, it just has row and column column for the other cell. So that's nice. So I know I have these two constructors here. So how do I implement this? Uh, you, you notice that the issue here is uh, I need to implement, uh, create a new formula and pass it a string. Now the string could be either equals four plus B1 or it could be just A1. Uh, and I wanted to create either an expression or a reference depending on what string I pass it. So I could think, okay, well, no problem. I could just do this. I'm going to say my formula. I'm going to put a constructor up here. I'm going to say, well, if my formula uh, starts with the equal sign, then I'm going to write it's, it's an expression. So I'm going to call this constructor. Otherwise, it's a reference. So I'm going to call this constructor over here. So that looks good, right? Except you hopefully, maybe, have you noticed that this is impossible? Uh, so in Java and pretty much any programming language, the constructor cannot return anything. So your constructor can't return a new expression. Uh, you can't, doesn't return anything. And so this is, this is a no-go. You cannot do this. You can't do this. Uh, uh, so what do we do? How do we uh, do this? This seemed like a good idea where I can pass it any string and return either an expression or a reference. Um, so we use the, whoops, the factory method. Uh, the factory method is a very, very common pattern. You'll see it all over Java libraries uh, and, you know, any object-oriented programming language. And what you do is you create a static method, right? So uh, this is a, uh, uh, if you've forgotten, oops static method so the underline you see this is underline is that means it's static so make formula is a static method of uh, this class so what it's doing and you see the code right there it's just it's doing the same thing as before so it's just saying if s starts with the equal sign then uh, now I uh, I have this other methods make formula up here and in my expression and in my reference and I'm going to call those directly. So the parent formula calls the other two guys to make it. But the main thing of the factory method is this method here 
uh, this is the one, the one at the top that's called the factory method. And uh, it allows us, as you can see, to make and return either an expression or a reference. Uh, and now you see, uh, well, I didn't show it here, but this, this make formula returns something of type formula. Right, the return type for this method is formula uh, and it can either be an expression or a reference. So this works because uh, this one returns something of type expression, this one returns of type reference, but both of these types are subtypes of formula. So this works. Right. And so that's the factory method and that's what we use it for. One, one big reason we use it for is because the factory method can do these kind of things. It can return, it doesn't have to return just a formula per se, it can return subtypes of the type, which you cannot do uh, using just the, the standard constructor uh, or a constructor. And uh, also we can use this, uh, another reason we use this is uh, it can sometimes return null, right? So maybe you decide that the user passed you a string that, you know, that string is no good. And uh, so I'm just gonna return null. I'm not gonna make the formula for you. Or you can throw an exception, right? Although a constructor can also throw an exception, but uh, so that's another reason why you might do use the factory method. So uh, next. The iterator method is built into Java. Uh, it's also in the original book and it's super useful, right? So you use the iterator method all the time, but how many times have you actually implemented the iterator interface in your class? Well, you should, you should think about that, right? It's very easy. This is the actual Java iterator interface. You only have to implement these three methods. And uh, so if you have a class employees, uh, which is the collection of all your employees, maybe you you should think about implementing the iterator met, uh, interface for that class because it'll just make your code a lot easier to use. So it's already built in there. Uh, you you know how to use it, right? And it says if it has next, uh, then uh, you can call next and it returns the next element or you can remove the current element uh, using the remove method. Uh, easy to implement and you should do that. The singleton method, again, comes up all the time when you do an application and you need uh, one, just you want one instance of a particular class, right? So that's the singleton class. So a singleton class is one class, a class that only has one instance of it. You, obviously, you don't have to call it singleton. Uh, and it's usually used to keep, or often used, to keep uh, sort of a global variables, right? The state of the app and any global variables that you need throughout. Uh, these are things like a reference to a file. So if you don't want to open multiple references to a file that you're reading or writing from, you just want the one and that's it. Uh, singleton class to the rescue or you know to a database or to a socket, etc. cetera. Uh, but also just any other global state that you might need. And uh, you can implement that in Java like this, right? So you can have a public static final singleton instance. So the instance variable holds the singleton itself, right? And then you can have another static uh, member uh, function that, uh, or property that returns the instance. Right. So you have just the one instance and it returns it. This is the, uh, the simplest way of creating a singleton. If you go again, read more about it. There are other ways of creating a singleton that this, this might not be useful for every time because you know it gets created. As you can see, when the class is read, you might need to not create it right away, create it later on. And so night, then you have to do it in a different way. But uh, that's the basic idea. You have static. A uh, data member that refers to the actual instance, and then you yes, you have to do this part here where the constructor, you know, you null it. So uh, sorry, you make it private so nobody can create any instance of the class, right? So this is the key point here is this private uh, constructor. 
So by doing that, you're preventing anybody from creating it. You can only create it. Uh, you can only get at the singleton class with the get, get instance method. The decorator pattern. This is another one. So uh, another fun one. So let's say you want to build, you're building sort of a GUI and you have a window, uh, sort of a basic window. We'll call it the simple window. And you, you want your program. So some windows can have a horizontal scroll bar. Some windows can have vertical scroll bar and some windows can have both. And maybe there's a bunch of other things uh, like a title bar or a 3D shadow, etc. And you want to be able to create any combination of windows. Uh, so a window with a horizontal, horizontal bar and shadows or a window with shadows and vertical bar, but no horizontal. So how do you do that? You can use the decorator pattern to do that. You see, the problem is you can't just create one class for every possible combination of these things, right? So if you have 10 of these, there's two to the 10 possible combinations, you know, that explodes. You, you really do not want that many classes and you don't need them. Uh, another example, by the way, is uh, uh, if you're building uh, any kind of game and this is uh, sort of a character and these are abilities in the character. Uh, so I might have a jumping ability or sliding ability or throwing ability and you want characters to have any possible combination of abilities. Uh, so, uh, and uh, how do you do that? So the, uh, let's look at the code here. What you want to be able to do is create a window with any possible combination of this. And then you want to be able to call the draw method and then have that, that draw method call all the draw methods for that window. Let's start by looking at how I create the window W here. So here is W uh, with the call. And you see, you know, the first thing I do is create the simple window. So and this, this is the code for a simple window. It's, it's nothing. So it's a, just a basic window. It's got nothing in it that we're interested in right now. So it just creates that, returns that. Then I use that to call the horizontal scroll bar decorator constructor. And uh, I don't have the code for that, but the, the code for the horizontal is the same as for the vertical, which is, and the code is right here. So you see, we end up calling this constructor right here. And all the only thing that this constructor does is it's called this parent constructor, which is the window decorator here, which is an abstract class. Uh, we keep, yep, right here. And uh, all the constructor does right here is it just stores that window, right? So it stores that is in a member variable uh, and that's it. And we store it so that later on when you call the draw method on the vertical scroll bar, this is the key point here, the draw method. The first thing it does is it calls its parent, calls its parent draw method, right? And then its parent draw method, you see right here, it is gonna use that save window and call the draw method on itself. So we're doing delegation here, right? So the draw method calls the other guy's draw method and then the other guy's draw method is gonna probably call the previous guy's draw method and so forth uh, until you know we get to the simple window, which doesn't do that, you see? Uh, so that's what, how that works, right? So this draw method calls, first calls the stored variables draw method and then does his own drawing, right? So first, so what's going to happen is down here on this call, when I do w dot draw, it's going to call the vertical scroll bar decorator draw method. And that's going to call this guy's draw method, which is going to call this guy's draw method, simple window. That's going to draw the simple window. Then we're going to come back here. We're going to draw the horizontal scroll bar. Then we're going to come back here and draw the vertical scroll bar or because of this bit of code right here, right? So might look a little bit complicated with all the code, but it's actually quite simple. You are just chaining these, the same, you know, because we're chaining these here and we're doing this. Now this change it chains, you know, one after the other, the calls to the draw method. So this is a, a nice way of creating the, this kind of functionality. The facade, the facade is useful when you're using a lot of libraries. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, you're using a library that has a lot of functionality and might be a bit tricky to use and you need to use it in various parts of the program and you want to uh, 
you know, uh, uh, protect yourself and the members of your teams from the complexity of this client library. Say, you know, it's a CSV library or, or a graphics library or a compression library that you're using. Uh, and uh, it's got some odd thing that it's just complicated to use. Uh, usually because you're only using part of it, right? So usually the library, it has all this functionality, but you only need like 10% of it. And so you want to create this facade or a class that just extracts and translates from, you know, sort of their language to your language. And the methods in your class are more in line of with what you want to do, right? So something like, you know, write file, whereas they might have some complicated named methods. You have a method here called write file and then calls that class and the class does its thing. And also useful when you have to, like in this example here, merge two client libraries uh, into, and because you know that these two client libraries are never gonna be used by anything else in your program. They're always gonna be used together. So you put a facade on that and write the methods for your program. So this is very nice. I mean, it means that, you know, the person that is writing the facade becomes the expert in these two libraries. Nobody else in the team ever needs to know anything about these two libraries, right? So you encapsulate that. You're encapsulating the complexity of reading all this documentation and understanding on that is encapsulated by this facade and you are preventing anybody else in the team from having to deal with all that and they'll be thankful for it and you will be too. The flyweight, another pattern. Uh, so say you, you're building sort of a, you know, uh, a game. Uh, this is Angry Birds where you have a whole bunch of little pigs. And uh, so you have a pig class. A pig has the X and Y location of the pig in the screen, right? So he's on the screen somewhere. But it also has a, the, the graphic representation and a sound representation and maybe some other state. So you have these other data members uh, which are large, they use a lot of memory, right? These are large memory hogs, and uh, you can need a lot of pigs in your application, like thousands, say. Uh, so you have this problem, like every time you call a new pig, it's gonna make a copy of this, but you realize that, you, you know, all the pigs look the same, let's say, uh, or, you know, at least a lot of them look the same and they sound the same. So these is going to be shared among all those pigs, right? So uh, what do you do? Uh, you, you want to reduce, you really don't need all those copies of that, but for whatever reason, you, you know, you, you, you have, this is how you started, which was fine at first, but now you realize that I need to not use up so much memory because things are getting too slow. So you can use the flyweight pattern. What you do in the flyweight is you take that one class and split it into two, the pig client and the pig implementation. Uh, so it's gonna work as follows. Let's look, let's start down here where we see how it's actually used. So I created basically a bunch of pigs here, the first line. So the pig is an interface. So, and this is just uh, saving space here. And then here's where I actually have a for loop. I'm gonna create a hundred pigs. And I call new pig client. I give it a X and Y location. So let's look at that. The pig client constructor is right here, um, or down here. Sorry, uh, my pig client X Y. Uh, but up here, you'll notice that uh, I have a data member called pig, and that one actually calls this pig factory called get pig and here's the pig factory the get pig is a static method as you can see because i'm calling it this way it has to be a static method and what this guy does it uh it this implements the, the singleton pattern right so here we have another instance of the singleton pattern which we talked about singleton pattern right here. I have only the one pig and if pig is null, I create a new one. Otherwise I return my one pig. So that is how I, I make sure that there is only one pig and notice that I'm using the pig implementation, right? Uh, the pig implementation has the shared state. Um, so I do that. Uh, then, um, so I, I created, this is how it happens. So I created my new pig client, XY comes here. 
and then each one of these new pick clients just has a reference to the one pick. So I have a bunch of pick clients, but each one just referencing because of this pick variable, it referencing the same graphical representation. And that, that's uh, pretty much it. So then when I call, you know, I can take one of the, any one of those, I call the move of them, move method. So here's the implementation. I call move. Uh, move is going to call pig. We have to do the delegation thing again. So I have to call pig.move. So uh, that's going to call this method here with a move, which, you know, might or might not do anything, right? Because so depending, maybe move, when you move a pig, it changes its graphical representation. Yeah, probably not, right? So probably this doesn't do anything. Um, but in the general case, you know, you want to, you, this is where you might, you would do the delegation. Uh, and then you actually change, do move them, change the coordinates. And then the draw method is, so when I call, I want to draw the pig, a new pick at a new location calls this draw method and then here I, I definitely need the delegation so here it is I'm gonna call this pig draw which call this one and this is the one that actually draws the pig because it has the graphical representation uh, in this case this method here doesn't do anything else extra because the client just has X and Y location um, so that's the flyweight and the last one is the command uh, the command design pattern is is useful when uh, you want to implement undo so you notice most applications have an undo you can go edit undo undo the last command uh, in order to implement that nicely you you want to do something like implement commands itself explicitly so here the word command means you know cut paste save, open, uh, those kind of things. Uh, we're showing it with a little light bulb example. So you have a light bulb, uh, the light bulb will have a switch, right? And the switch uh, can take the command. So let's look at the code here. I create a new light. So we can think of this. Uh, another, uh, sim another example might be uh, you're making a drawing program, right? Where you draw stuff. And uh, that command is going to have, uh, I mean, that program is going to have commands like draw square and draw circle and draw triangle, right? So we can think of the light as the canvas, right? This is the canvas where you're drawing. So the switch, um, oh, it's the canvas. And uh, so then the commands here, I have the flip up command. Think of it another way. In the other example, that would be like draw a square command. The down command is draw a circle command, etc. So the key thing is that the command, you see command up, right? Command is an actual interface. And the various commands flip up and flip down or draw a circle, draw a square, they're classes. So we create a command to do something as an actual instance of a class. So here up and down are actual instances. And then when it comes time to actually execute them, so here I'm just creating them, I'm not doing them. Uh, when I actually have to turn the switch on, I call switch and then call store and execute the up command. So, and that's implemented here in the canvas or switch. You will say, I want to store and execute the up command. And what this guy does is it stores it in a history. So I have some an array list of all commands and then actually call the execute method on it. The execute method is, is part of the interface, is the only method in the interface. That, so every command has to implement the execute method and that's what it does. It. So it seems a little longer, obviously it is a little longer, but what you're gaining from this is you're gaining this history, right? So because every time I want to do something now, I have to go through store and execute, right? I, uh, I have, I get the thing added to it. So then now if I need to add an undo command, I can say, I can just add an undo to all my commands. And now that means that I have to implement undo for all these guys. And that's going to be different, right? For every command, some of them, it might be impossible. So maybe you don't do anything in those cases. 
So in a canvas, I can undo, draw a square, undo, draw a triangle, draw a circle. Um, but I can do that, so I can add those undo commands um, to my commands, and then because I have a history, I can you know implement another method here that is the actual un undo, which is uh, undo, which is just going to go and pick the latest command, the most recent command from my history, and call undo on it. And that's how you implement undo uh, and execute and any other you know sort of things that you need to do with commands themselves. So very useful. Uh, this is you know for GUI apps like most desktop and even mobile apps where you have menu items that do things that you need to undo or redo and that kind of stuff.